or at least I will try to. OK. OK, the meeting is being recorded. Let's open our agenda. And here's Emily. We were just going to get we were just going to jump into the agenda. So good timing. Hello. Hey, Emily, can you hear us? Yes, I couldn't at first, but that's because the site I had a mute thing on. So sorry. Okay. About that. Sorry. Okay. Okay. A little bit late. No worries. Welcome. We're at a quorum and we were just going to uh, get into the agenda, so I will turn things over to you. Okay. Our guests are here and I'll just say Ellen did send some written testimony uh, right before the meeting. I've asked her to forward it to all the subcommittee members and I think it just popped into my inbox. OK, great, Ellen. Thank you. OK, well, let's see. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, if you've got the agenda in front of you, we have two very, very short items before we hear from our guests. Um, and I just also want to draw your attention to the uh, agenda that got sent around, had two guests on it, Ellen and Rachel, and Tom Holt will also be joining us. He can't join us till two o'clock. Um, so we'll, he's a lobbyist with the SPJ, so we'll hear from him then. Um, but so the very first um, item is just to approve the agenda, which I will read for anybody who can't see it. We'll approve the agenda. The agenda is to do that, then have a brief review of the shared documents in the system for sharing information as we do these research hearings. Um, we will hear th um, from three people today um, giving us, you know, testimony and perspective on, um, on our uh, quest to learn more about better ways to deal with costs of public records in Oregon. Um, that's um, Ellen Osana. So I'm not, I'm, Ellen, I'm never sure how to pronounce your last name. We were joking about this yesterday in uh, <laughs> when we were talking about uh, about you appearing. But um, so can you can you tell me now? What Absolutely, it is, is Osanac. Much Osanac. easier to pronounce than it looks. So Osanac. Thank you. Um, so Ellen Osanac, um, who's the local legal initiative attorney with the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, um, and Rachel Alexander, who chairs the Freedom of Information Committee for the Society of Professional Journalists, and she's the managing editor of the Salem Reporter. And then, as I mentioned, we'll hear from Tom Holt, who's a lobbyist for the SPJ, Oregon chapter. And um, then we will uh, talk about, um, and there'll be time, obviously, for questions and whatnot in that testimony. Um, I think each of them plans to present for five to 10 minutes. Um, then we will have uh, a conversation within the committee on what we want to request LPRO to um, research, as we talked about in our full PROC committee last week. Um, we'll take any public comment that anybody has on anything that the, that the um, people testifying today had to, had to offer or the LPRO request. And then we'll make a decision on that LPRO request which I will get to Senator Thatcher. Um, and then we'll just look ahead um, to the next uh, set of hearings um, and try to see if people can pick up um, certain dates to, to bring in other folks to talk to us and so forth. So that is the agenda. Can I have a, any objections or anybody wanna add anything or can I have a motion to approve it? So moved. Okay, anybody second it? Second. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. Great. Thank you. The agenda is approved. Okay. And before we get into Ellen, um, the um, brief review of the shared documents. So to all the subcommittee members, um, I sent you an email with a couple of um, attachments. One is a Word document that um, just uh, it is a uh, an offering that if you'd like to use that sort of framework to take notes during these um, hearings, please feel free. I included three questions that I think are kind of going to be the things we're going to want to you know try to be getting out of this um, hearing. And I actually don't have it in front of me, so I can't tell you what they are, <laughs> but you all should. And I'll pull it up in just a second. Um, so that's an optional note taking sheet, um, but just trying to make it both easy and um, systematic in terms of collecting our, um, our reactions and most especially further questions that the testimony we hear, you know, creates, brings up for us. So that is, um, that's something that I hope can be a useful tool for you. And then the other document that I sent was a PDF um, of, uh, a PDF of a Google document, which um, contains, 
the dates of our meetings and a little um, grid for whoever is going to be able to plan those meetings um, to bring in witnesses to those meetings to 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 fill out to take take ownership of at the bottom of it it has a um, running list to be added to of topics to cover and um, and um, uh, potential guests to hear from so um, just to remind you of those those exist and at the um, end of the meeting I'd like to just touch on how we should go forward um, the, a Google Doc or a state you know shared file a document that Todd's been exploring or you just email me things and I update it anyway so that will be something we will want to decide at the end of the meeting um, any questions about that before we we dive in no okay great then I am really happy to have you here, Ellen and Rachel. And um, Ellen, why don't you take it away? Great. Um, so my name is Ellen Osanak uh, and Chair Harris and members of the subcommittee. I really appreciate the opportunity uh, and the invitation to speak to you today about the work that you are embarking on to tackle what um, the public records advocate in 2018 and 2019 identified as one of the most significant issues facing um, Oregon in terms of public records, which is um, figuring out how to more fairly apportion the costs of records requests between requesters and the government. Um, and so I wanted to um, tell you a little bit about um, the reporters committee, uh, who they are, um, what the local legal initiative is, and then who I am and why it is that I'm uh, here doing this work. Um, so the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press was founded in the 1970s. It's a nonprofit association. Uh, we are the first and only organization um, who are exclusively focused on providing legal services to journalists and news organizations. Um, we are nonpartisan. Um, and uh, we are established experts on the First Amendment and its freedoms in providing um, protections for news gathering, access to courts, access to public records. Um, and we gained that expertise over the last 50 years um, by primarily engaging in litigation um, in state and federal courts throughout the country, including in Oregon. Um, our mission is really uh, to protect the right to gather and report the news and to enhance government accountability by ensuring access to public records, meetings, and courtrooms. Um, and in early 2019, as I think many of you know, because uh, you participated in the application process, uh, the Knight Foundation identified a critical resource gap um, in the local level uh, for local journalists and news organizations. And that was a lack of legal support. Um, and this is legal support for everything from defense of subpoenas um, that are directed towards sources uh, that uh, news organizations and reporters use um, and uh, everything from that um, to defending against lawsuits when agencies um, appeal uh, public records decisions um, and then on the more affirmative side, um, seeking access to court proceedings, sealed documents, uh, and public records denials. And so um, in order to address that uh, local need, the Reporters Committee um, asked uh, folks in all the 50 states uh, to submit applications um, describing why it is that they believed that their state um, was both in need of an embedded attorney, but also what the conditions were in each of the states um, that would make it favorable for a national organization like RCFP um, to litigate and actually be able to move the law and policy uh, in the various states. Um, and I couldn't be prouder as somebody that's lived in Oregon for the last 25 years um, that Oregon was selected out of a very competitive application process. Um, and without uh, appearing to pander too much, I think an enormous amount of credit has to go both to the public records advocate and to the public records advisory council to you all, um, because you have persisted for many years in the face of significant institutional challenges <clears throat> in um, making sure that the legislature has uh, a lot of information and um, really informed and balanced recommendations about how best to produce public records 
And in particular, um, the Reporters Committee identified Oregon as a place where um, there was a significant commitment from the public and from institutions um, to really uh, trying to make government here as transparent as possible. And so um, I think um, part of why I'm here today um, as my first appearance um, in front of any um, public body talking about this work, uh, I'm so pleased that it is before a PRAC subcommittee because um, uh, you all really deserve um, an enormous amount of credit for um, the thoughtful and careful work that you've done over the years. Um, and I just am, uh, am really grateful to have the opportunity to um, let you all know a little bit about the program and um, the experiences that I've had representing uh, journalists and news organizations here in seeking public records in particular, and how costs have um, affected both uh, the clients that I've represented, but also um, to help you all um, have some concrete examples as you struggle with um, what the different models are that might uh, ameliorate some of the high costs. Um, so the local legal initiative was launched um, in 2020. And um, I have been uh, the local legal initiative attorney for um, a little over a year, about 16 months. Um, and in the first two weeks uh, that, um, that I was hired, um, I received at least two phone calls uh, on our hotline um, from journalists who were not able to pursue um, uh, breaking news stories um, because they could not um, afford the, the fees that were being imposed um, by the agency. Um, and that was my first introduction um, to uh, really the challenges that um, particularly um, breaking news has uh, when it comes to fees. There's just simply not enough time um, to, even with Oregon's streamlined appeals process, um, to appeal those kind of uh, fee determinations. Um, and, uh, and so that was my uh, rapid introduction to um, how it is that one person, uh, me, couldn't possibly uh, address in a statewide fashion um, the needs um, of journalists, even though uh, Oregon provides for an appeal process where a requester feels like the fees are unreasonable. And I just want to pause here for a moment uh, and explain a little bit uh, about my background and why it might be uh, unique in this context. Um, I do not come from a media law background. Um, I, in fact, come from a background of having practiced um, in my 20 years as an attorney, primarily for the government. Um, so I was a prosecutor and then after that, a senior deputy city attorney for the city of Portland. So I have extensive experience on the agency and government side of things in assessing um, the, the public interest in public records, in um, defending the government, in petitions. Um, and I've been asked uh, many times, well, you know, given your background, why, um, why is it that you uh, have decided to work for the Reporters Committee? And one of the things I can tell you is that um, like many folks over the last three to four years, um, I was personally really concerned about the deterioration that I saw in, um, in the discourse and um, what I perceive as the erosion of some of our fundamental democratic values. And uh, because I consider myself an Oregonian, um, I am uh, deeply committed to the sunshine and the transparency um, that Oregon's public records laws provide. Um, and so um, it was a pivotal moment for me um, when I saw that our CFP had committed such significant resources at the state level um, to attempting to really fulfill you know, the purpose of the public records laws, which is to provide accountability and transparency. Um, and so I thought it was um, an important uh, time in our history to uh, lend my services um, to the fight for government transparency. And um, I was really honored that our CFP um, chose to hire me for this position. Um, so when I say that, uh, that high public records fees um, are a significant deterrent to reporting, I come from the perspective of also acknowledging that agencies and um, and the government have an interest in uh, both recouping costs, but also in 
um, in deterring overly broad requests or um, harassing type requesters. So it, it's not, uh, in my opinion, that um, this is an all or nothing proposition. But at the same time, the First Amendment in particular and, um, and Oregon's constitution as well as the public records law make it abundantly clear that records belong to the people and that the access that the government can and should provide um, needs to be robust. And to the extent that you all are finding um, in your research, as I have in my experience, that the way in which um, the current scheme apportions costs uh, it works both to the detriment of requesters, because often the fees are uh, too high, and to agencies who do not have appropriate standards for determining when to grant fee waivers or um, how to uh, make decisions about reductions, um, I think there's a lot of room for improvement here. And before you all uh, ask me what I think the solutions are to this policy uh, conundrum, I will simply say, um, as I did in my letter, there are a number, I think, of promising options, which uh, certainly in 2019, the Public Records Advocates Report laid out many of them. Um, and uh, Reporters Committee doesn't have any particular... <laughs> Sorry, that's my dog, obviously. <laughs> Charlie. Uh, we don't have any particular position um, about uh, your policy choices, but as you go along, um, I'd certainly be happy to um, offer uh, opinion or insight if you all feel that would be helpful. And um, in closing, I just wanted to point out, as I did in the letter, um, one specific example, I think, um, that is illustrative of, of the problem, even when the system is working um, according to the law. So um, many of you are aware of the University of Oregon's Catalyst Journalism Program, um, which is just an exemplary um, program um, that encourages just fantastic journalism. And I encourage you to visit their site where you can see the incredible investigative journalism that students have done there. They partnered with Eugene Weekly to investigate the death of a man um, who had been experiencing a mental health crisis. And his wife had called 911 and asked if they could send CAHOOTS, which many of you may know is um, a specialized behavioral health unit. Um, and in addition to CAHOOTS responding, uh, officers from the Eugene Police Department also responded. Um, they ended up using a significant amount of force, tasering, um, uh, kicks, uh, fists, um, and all of that was captured on body camera video. And uh, in order to really fully understand the circumstances of, uh, of Mr. Payne's death, uh, the Eugene Weekly and the Cattles Journalism uh, Project asked for body camera videos um, that the officers had worn, and there were multiple officers. And the city of Eugene responded that they um, believed that they did not have to release the videos. And so we utilized the petition process and the Lane County District Attorney issued a very um, thoughtful and detailed opinion describing the public interest, the significant public interest in the release of these body-worn camera videos. Um, nevertheless, uh, the city and ordered them disclosed. Nevertheless, the, the city of Eugene, uh, upon receiving the order, um, refused to grant Eugene Weekly and the Catalyst Journalism Project, um, despite the, the clear public interest and the, uh, the public service that both of those organizations provide, um, the city of Eugene refused to grant a complete fee waiver. And uh, they imposed a modest reduction, um, but the cost of one and a half hours of this body camera video was over $600. And um, while, Catalyst and Eugene um, paid, and that was for a single officer. While they did end up paying for that video, um, you know, th that is a significant barrier to anyone uh, seeking to um, utilize what has been adopted as a significant government accountability tool. Um, and so I think it's a good example of how even when um, the law is playing out perhaps as not as the legislature intended, but as it is written, which is if there's a public interest, 
um, in a particular record and, it primar and its release would primarily benefit the public, then an agency may reduce or waive fees. And I think that's the significant problem. It's too discretionary. There's not, unlike the federal FOIA exemption, it doesn't say you shall grant it. Um, there is no, there's no guidance for custodians about if I determine that there's a substantial public interest or if a district attorney tells me there's a substantial public interest, I have no idea what or how I'm supposed to figure out how much um, I should impose um, as a cost. Um, so I'll stop there and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. And again, just thank you for the opportunity um, and really um, think that this significant issue, I'm so, so very glad that you made it a priority for your 2023 legislative. Great, thanks a lot, Ellen. Um, I have a couple questions if I might kick it off. Um, one is, um, I'm curious why the body camera footage was is so expensive. And then uh, the other thing I wanted to ask about is um, uh, a finding of public interest. Just, I'd be curious in any, any of your thoughts on how that might be standardized. Big question, I know. Uh, well, I'll start with a um, somewhat easier, the um, why is body worn camera video so expensive? Um, I mean, I, I, without going into too much detail, um, as you all probably know, um, the legislature uh, tackled body camera uh, videos in 2017. They passed um, a specific exemption um, that, uh, that asks agencies to determine whether or not there's a public interest in uh, releasing the video. And if they do, the legislature imposed a requirement that the faces in the video be blurred. Um, and, you know, with respect at the time, I think the legislature probably uh, believed that there was sufficient software um, that this type of redaction would not be onerous. Um, but it turns out that uh, this um, unfunded mandate to the, the cities um, resulted in those cities that did adopt body-worn cameras um, did not necessarily adopt or want to pay for the software package that came with the body-worn camera. So for example, um, in Eugene and Lane County, um, they have Axon body cameras and Axon um, has some software, but you have to pay for that software. Um, you have to subscribe to it. And, um, and so um, in the absence of any direction from the legislature, um, you know, I think uh, cities just made their own determination about whether or not they wanted to purchase the redaction subscription. Um, if you don't purchase the redaction subscription, what that means is that you have to go through um, and manually redact the faces. And so the best example I can use is for those that um, have an iPhone, uh, the newer ones now, when you hold up your phone to take a picture, you know how it uh, will, it has little yellow boxes that it will put on the faces. Um, that's what the software, the manual software is. And so it can identify faces, but then you have to manually go in almost frame by frame um, and blur the faces. It's a long-winded explanation to make, I think, a more, a simpler point, which is, um, particularly in the context of body-worn cameras, um, the cost of redaction um, of records and um, reviewing those records, for example, by an attorney, um, those are things I think that, um, that are a fruitful area <laughs> for this committee to focus on because, um, you know, if the, if the government bears more of the cost of performing redactions, particularly of body-worn camera videos, then there's some incentive to, uh, business incentive then to make sure that their ability to redact is as efficient as possible. Right now, that is not the case. Um, and then your second question, which was, um, you know, how can we further define the public interest? Um, you know, I, I will speak for my chair as an attorney and uh, not to throw Ms. Alexander in the bus, but I'm quite curious to hear what she has to say about this. Um, but as an attorney, um, the I think I'm less concerned about the ability of custodians to determine what the public interest is, although I acknowledge that it is challenging. Um, 
in the FOIA context, for example, there's just lots of case law talking about what the public interest is. And it's the same here in Oregon. There are um, lots of cases and of course the excellent uh, attorney general's manual and provides lots of examples of what the public interest is. And so I think the gap um, for custodians can often be um, that is one of education rather than perhaps a, a needed change in the law. Um, but I think the, you know, that's that's perhaps uh, Chair Harris, the uh, the attorney in me that thinks, well, you know, there's case law out there and, and there's a manual that talks about it. And so um, I acknowledge that, you know, there's, uh, it, it is perhaps confusing, and um, but I think those who practice in this area, including custodians, um, rapidly become familiar with it. Um, and I just would say one last thing about that, which is um, I, I think it's also, um, and I don't have a policy recommendation, but I think sometimes um, it's less a matter of what the law says because, um, for example, um, particularly in the context of certain police records, police reports, even body-worn camera videos, um, the law is quite clear that something like a significant use of force um, that, uh, that the public's under need to understand and hold um, officials accountable to ensure that police are acting fairly and, and justly, um, that those things are clearly established public interests. Uh, and so sometimes it's a matter of the application of those things and the, the practice, not the law or the policy, but the practice of agencies is just to say, you know, we are not going to independently determine what the public interest is. We'd much rather a district attorney tell us to do that. Thank you. Um, Mark, I think you had your hand up before and I think you've lowered it, but would you like to ask a question, Mark Landauer? Yeah, thank you, Emily. And Ellen, thank you so much for being here. Um, it's been many years since I saw you last at the city of Portland. Um, so good to see you. Um, the whole public interest issue is <clears throat> a challenge for me sometimes. And uh, let me give you an example. Um, I've said probably a couple times before this committee, probably much to some of my colleagues' angst, that when a legitimate member of the media is asking for records from the public, I think personally, again, there's an inherent public interest. That's my opinion. Um, and so that's sort of the angle I'm coming from. With that bias, though, I've often struggled when an uh, individual citizen comes before a public body requesting records and claiming that the fee should be waived because there is a public interest. And this is something that I, I suspect others have, have um, struggled with as well. Do you have, you know, understanding there's case law and history here, is there a and the reason I'm raising this question is simply because there was a bill introduced last session dealing with costs, in particular, addressing public interest, media, and things of that nature. I'm just curious, is there, a, in your mind, a clear way to differentiate what's in the public interest, not for the media, because again, I, I come from the belief that I think that there's an inherent public interest if a person from a legitimate media source is asking for records. Uh, but that's not necessarily the case for um, an individual citizen. Have you given that any thought? And if so, can you share some of those thoughts with us? And, and you certainly don't have to answer that now, but this is, uh, this is an area that I struggle with a, a little bit. And, and I'd just love to hear your, your thoughts on that. Thank you so much for being here today and taking the time. Yeah, Mr. Landauer, thank you for the question. Uh, it's also nice to see you. It seems like it has been a while. For those that don't know, uh, many years ago, uh, Mr. Landauer and I uh, both worked for the city of Portland. Um, so uh, to answer your question, um, the you know as as a as an attorney who's currently uh, representing you know news organizations <clears throat> and journalists, even freelance journalists, um, I think uh, 
you know, my primary goal is to ensure that um, that those organizations who, as you point out, are so clearly working in the public interest um, and for the public benefit, that, that that is recognized both by the law and in practice by custodians. But your point is well taken that um, there's a tension between preferentially treating those organizations and or distinguishing those organizations and journalists um, from other types of requesters. And so um, I think the best example that I can use is um, when a, um, a private litigant in a, in a civil suit um, wants to you know, obtain public records. And so they will you know, ask for those records and thanks to case law and the, and the uh, attorney general's manual, it is quite clear that in most of those cases where you have a requester that is a civil litigant that's asking for records, um, that the primary benefit accrues to the individual. It doesn't mean that there might not be a public interest in the, the records that they're seeking, but their primary purpose in utilizing the records will be for a private benefit. And so I think that's the, the key distinction, um, at least you know, for the purposes of what I sense your question is, which is, you know, if if ever, you know, even where records are in the public interest, Oregon law still requires that the release of them must primarily benefit the public. And so I think that distinction is um, is workable. But uh, I think in practice, what often happens is that the two do become conflated, that there's there may be a public interest in these. And so custodians and agencies are struggling to figure out whether or not the, the public interest also means there's a public benefit. Um, and so to your point, uh, Mr. Landauer, I think that the legislation that was introduced last year um, was, you know, specifically targeted at that conundrum um, that how do you determine whether or not the release is going to be primarily um, in the benefit of the public. And so certainly the, um, the organizations and journalists that I represent um, have no problem making a compelling case that uh, the, they are working in, uh, for the public and on behalf of the public and will be distributing their records uh, and producing reporting based on them that, that primarily benefits the public. Does that answer your question, Mark? you have any follow-ups, sir? Well, I just like, I, I do think that this is going to be a interesting discussion topic for us. Um, and I, I'm I'm just trying to get um, various views, and I, I very much appreciate you sharing those with us, Ellen. I, I just think this is going to be a uh, th this particular part is going to be a thorny um, blackberry patch, if you will. So I'll, I'll just leave it at that. But again, um, you know, it, I, I do appreciate you very much taking the time sharing um, your thoughts. If I might just do one quick follow up, Madam uh, Madam Chair, um, Ellen, at the very beginning, you talked about um, your organization's um, um, application to, to receive funding for your position, apparently. <laughs> um, how many other states received um, this um, this Distinguished, you know, award number one, and number two. You mentioned that um, in part the, the award was given to Oregon due to the work that the Public Records Advocate has been doing, and and, and so forth. I'm curious, was the grant also given to Oregon because Oregon is seen as and and forgive me for the um, term I'll use here, a problem child in the public records. Um, world, so to speak. I'm just curious. I mean, it, it, you know, everybody gets report cards, right? Um, every state gets a report card for for many reasons, and you know, sometimes Oregon is good, sometimes we're rather miserable. And I'm just wondering if there was any, um, you know, measurement in in that area to award your organization, um, obviously the the funding that now supports your position. Yeah, thank you, um, um, 
Chair Harris, Mr. Landau, for that question that allows me to do a little humble brag uh, on the Reporters Committee in Oregon. Um, so uh, to answer your first question, the uh, there were five states, um, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Colorado, uh, Oklahoma, and Tennessee. Uh, those were the five states that were chosen. Um, and you are not uh, the first person that has asked me uh, does this reflect that Oregon is a is a problem child in the, in the records context? Um, and I prefer to think of it this way, uh, which is that Oregon presents um, opportunity. Yes, there are problems with uh, with the public records laws here, and in particular, the one that you are all are tackling, um, which is the cost of public records fees. Uh, I listened to your last meeting um, and agree with uh, Representative Thatcher that um, Oregon has in some ways, and in this context in particular, fallen behind nationwide. And um, there are many other models uh, for producing records that either cap costs, uh, apportion them differently between the government and requesters, um, cap costs, uh, you know, mandate, um, uh, mandatory fee waivers. I mean, there's just lots of different ways that states do it. And it's just not an area that Oregon um, has been able to tackle. Uh, and so um, I, I think that that's the real opportunity here. And I think what I would say in terms of um, Oregon selection, um, I it strongly represents I think the fact that um, these opportunities um, that Oregon presents for change um, have such strong institutional mechanisms to actually make that happen, the PRAC being one of them. And um, you, you know, your recommendations to the legislature carry so much weight because you are a body that is representative of government, of requesters, of media organizations. Um, and so you know, it's it's those kinds of opportunities that um, I think made Oregon's application stand out. In addition to the fact that um, that there are again significant opportunities, I think to uh, move the needle in the legal context here. That there is impact litigation that can really have um, important results here. And um, the body worn camera. Uh, case that I discussed is a very good example of the kind of impact litigation that um, that the reporters committee and I have identified um, as having an ability in Oregon to make a real impact. Great, thank you. Um, Steve, I'm gonna go to you and just, um, I know our next guest has to get back to reporting some news today. So um, not right away, but um, Ellen, we may have to have you back uh, for another, another time, but Steve, why don't you go ahead and then we'll move on to Rachel. You're muted, Steve. You're muted. I'll try to keep it brief. Um, Ellen, I really appreciate your perspective, both you know, representing the requester side and, and, and the public body, City of Portland, um, or your experience with that. Um, I was just a brief comment and then a brief question. Um, uh, Mark, you mentioned um, legitimate, legitimate news media. Um, I worked for, well, I still work for such an organization, but I work, I work for a different legitimate news media organization in Oregon for about 20, 20 years. And I can tell you every time I filed a records request, I requested a fee waiver. And I can tell you with the exception of, and I can also tell you all of my requests were in the public interest, not in my personal interest, not because I was curious, because, but because I actually was trying to conduct journalism. And with the exception of the Department of Environmental Quality, which has a very liberal fee waiver policy, I cannot remember a single time when I was granted a fee waiver without an order from a district attorney or the attorney general. Um, and I think that's probably pretty common of Oregon journalists. Um, so uh, Ellen, my quick question was, uh, you mentioned that at the beginning of your time here, you had a couple of breaking news um, events that had public records with large fees that deterred the requesters. Were those also body cam requests or what, what, what was their nature and what were the costs that we were talking about? Uh, the nature of those 
Um, and just uh, as a quick caveat um, for um, any, any journalists or news organizations that are watching, when you call our hotline, um, our services are confidential. And so I you know, don't disclose details, but that's not what you're asking me to do. Um, the nature of those were both um, local agencies. Um, one involved um, an economic development agency um, and the other involved um, a police agency. Uh, and um, the it was exactly as you described, uh, Mr. Sue, it, that um, it, the the fee waiver had been requested and denied, um, and um, it was a breaking enough news story um, that even the you know seven to fourteen day delay um, was simply going to make the news stale. And so um, I think um, yeah, it, it's exactly as you do, described. Do you, do you remember how much money we were talking about? Gosh, I I don't. I remember it was just enough that the that that it just was not in the news agency's budget. Um, and but they also, uh, I mean, this was a news agency that didn't have in-house counsel, um, both of them. And so, um, you know, it was, but it was also again not something that that could be delayed for litigation. But I don't remember the exact cost. Oh, fair enough. And I just wanted to uh, correct um, the record. Why did I agree to co-chair it? Does somebody have their mic on? The press needed to be the Well, anyway. If somebody decides Steve has their mic on, please go ahead and mute. And Steve, go ahead. Um. I do recall one one additional key for the Department of Human Services, and it was a fairly tough request. So, um, in in fairness, um, it, it does happen, but it, in, in my experience, it's the exception to the rule. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for the question, Steve and Ellen. Thank you so much for testifying. You're welcome to stick around, um, people, if you have time or if you need to go, that's fine too. Um, but we'll be in touch about possibly bringing you back as well. Um, Rachel Alexander with the Salem Reporter and SPJ. Thank you for being with us. Um, can you go ahead, please? Yeah, thanks. thank you all for having sure. me. Um, I let Emily know, but I do need to run it to 10 because the Omicron forecast is looking fun. So we've got to have some news conversations about that. But um, yeah, I'm so I'm chair of the Oregon Society for Professional Journalists Freedom of Information Committee. Um, I've been a journalist in Washington, Oregon for almost a decade, and I'm the managing editor of Salem Reporter now, as Emily mentioned. Um, so I've requested a lot of public records in my career um, from really small school districts in Washington to large state agencies in the federal government. And in my role with SPJ and working collaboratively with other newsrooms and journalists, I've had the opportunity opportunity to see a pretty wide range of responses to requests um, in Oregon. I also served for a year on the board of the Washington Coalition for Open Government before I moved to Oregon. So I'm very familiar with Washington records law um, and the differences between the two states. Um, the point I really want to bring home today is that Oregon records law um, currently with fees treats transparency as sort of an optional add-on, um, unfortunately, rather than a core function of government. Um, and the way that it's currently practiced, the public ends up paying twice, once to generate the records that are you know, supposed to be transparent and accessible, and then again to, um, to actually get those records later down the line. Um, and that's, you know, as, as many of you know, that's counter to the intent of the law when it was written and the efforts lawmakers have worked on in recent years to, um, to do transparency reforms and to make the system more accessible. But, um, but as long as record fees remain this high, it's kind of the one area of government where, um, where unfortunately agencies are able to act as if transparency is not a core function. And that has really tangible negative effects on Oregonians um, and on the quality of their government as well. So I wanted to talk a bit about um, both my experience as a journalist and then my experience working with our members um, and then offer some thoughts on what I think would be um, really helpful going forward. And then I'll be happy to take questions. Um, our experience is that inappropriately high fees for records routinely serve as barriers to disclosure of information, um, as Ellen already touched on. 
And what we often see is that high fees end up allowing for de facto denial of records when there's not actually a legal basis for denying those records in the first place. Um, so rather than an agency having to say, well, we don't want to release that under this ORS and then we can appeal that, they just say, well, it's going to cost this much. Um, and that amount may be hundreds or sometimes thousands of dollars. We found that this is particularly a problem in the city of Portland and local government agencies around the state. Larger media companies um, can sometimes pay those fees and may have in-house counsel, though even they have to pick and choose what they're able to pursue, unfortunately. Um, but smaller and less resource newsrooms may just simply stop filing requests or abandon projects. And there's kind of this chilling effect, I think, where local reporters just get worn down by the constant fights over fees and just knowing that they're not gonna get information. Um, and that's really unfortunate for the public because that doesn't allow us to fulfill our role, our role as watchdogs and to uncover corruption and malfeasance and waste. Um, I think when we're not able to do that or do it effectively, that means all Oregonians become less informed about their government and less trustful. Um, and it's a lot easier for, you know, poor elected officials or other people to obtain and stay in positions of power when we're not able to effectively watchdog um, or provide that public scrutiny. Um, when fees aren't used to block good reporting, though, we do see good things happen in Oregon, and that's why I really care about this issue. There have been um, three public corruption indictments in Oregon over the last six years that were directly the result of reporting based on public records law. Um, and more routinely, public records provide windows into all sorts of issues of public concern, um, like ongoing problems with Oregon State Hospital is just one example of something I've covered. And of course, state and local responses to the COVID pandemic. Um, I have one example from a fellow SPJ board member that I think is kind of illustrative of, of some of these challenges and the way that they play out in practice. Um, my colleague Kay Rambo, who um, was a reporter at the Albany paper, was working on um, following up on the departure of former OSU President F. Alexander this year, following revelations um, that sexual misconduct allegations were mishandled at Alexander's previous job at LSU. Um, so Rambo filed a very narrow public records request, you know, exactly the kind that we train people to file, which was seeking emails between Alexander, the president, and several members of the college's board of trustees. And it was for a period of about a week and emails between about six people. Um, so well-tailored, you know, not a fishing expedition. And OSU still said that that request would require an IT expert to search for emails and then came back with a $250 bill, which was after their standard 10% media fee reduction, um, which is not really much help. Um, and like many papers, that paper doesn't really have a budget anymore for public records requests. Um, and so Kay was only able to get those records because the SPJ chapter gave them a grant to do so. And obviously having a shoestring coalition of Oregon journalists crowdfunding public records request is not really a sustainable model for transparency. The resulting reporting showed that the college's board of trustees who are supposed to be holding the president accountable on behalf of the public were instead working with him behind the scenes to craft messaging um, after the sexual misconduct mishandling came to light. So it was definitely a matter of public concern and one that likely would have gone unreported were it not for, you know, our tiny little grant program. Um, but I think that example underscores a couple things we see a lot. You know, if OSU truly requires an IT expert to complete a basic email search, I think that raises more serious questions about how effectively a public university is using public resources and what sort of database program they have. Um, but whether it's out of malice or incompetence, current Oregon law has pretty much no recourse for journalists to push back against absurd fee claims short of filing a lawsuit. Um, so if you're denied records, you can appeal that. And if you're denied a fee waiver, you can appeal that. Um, but there's not an appeal process for the underlying reasonableness of the fees themselves. So if an agency says there's only one person who can review this and we pay them $600 an hour, you're kind of stuck. Um, and of course, I could spend all day listing egregious examples and I'd be more than happy to submit a list if that would be useful for the subcommittee's work. Um, but I want to address a point that I think often goes really overlooked in discussions on fees um, that I've found you know, over the years I've done this work, which is when agencies are able to pass on the full cost of staff time um, to requesters, whether that's media or other members of the public, 
There's little or no financial incentive for local governments to adopt modern records management practices or proactively release information or sometimes even to work with requesters to help them narrow their requests. So the current fee system, in our view, really incentivizes agencies to withhold documents and to keep Byzantine or outdated or just non-existent records management systems in place because the public ends up bearing those costs rather than the agency. Um, conversely, we found that governments that put time and effort into proactive disclosure and good records management systems often don't need to charge outrageous fees to recoup costs. That's been my experience with several agencies I cover, which is really lovely. Um, and that means those agencies are more able to aid the public effectively. I think, um, you know, this might be an obvious example, but the city of Salem, and this is not terribly unusual, has a permit database, for instance, and anyone can go on there and search for permits. And that means I don't have to waste time emailing someone at the city every time we want to look up a permit. They don't have to waste time responding to that. Anyone in the public can say like, oh, what's being built down my street and look it up. It's just, it works well for everyone. It saves time, it saves money, it saves public resources, and it makes government more transparent for citizens, which is exactly what we should be doing. Um, our members understand concerns from local government agencies, especially smaller ones, about overly broad requests that consume staff time. Um, and I do think that's an important conversation to have. But my experience also as a requester is that there's often very little relationship between the size of a government agency and its helpfulness um, or transparency when, resp when responding to records requests. I've seen a really wide range of responses that have honestly very little to do with agency size or staffing. Um, some of the Oregon agencies that are most notorious for secrecy are some of the largest local governments in the state, specifically the city of Portland and the Portland Police Bureau come up time and time again when we talk to members about where they've had especially bad experiences. Um, the other point I want to make is that even when agencies do have policies in place for fee reductions or waivers currently, they rarely serve their intended purpose of actually making records accessible. Um, because what we see pretty commonly is that agencies will have a standard percent reduction for media or for public interest, but it's typically something like 50% or possibly less. And that doesn't really do a lot of good when an initial records fee estimate is you know, $500 or $1,000. At the end of the day, it still ends up being a higher cost than a lot of people can afford to pay. Um, and that ends up being insurmountable for a lot of requesters. So. We feel Oregonians would all benefit from fee reform that incentivizes modern records management practices, incentivizes narrowly tailored requests for information, and waives most or all fees for requesters who are acting in the public interest. Um, and so that's what I have to say, and I would be happy to take questions. Great. Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, I have a couple of questions, but does anybody else on the committee have a question for Rachel first? Okay, well, you keep thinking while I um, while I dive in. Um, Rachel, you talked about um, ideas to incentivize cities to manage their records better, and this database um, example in the city of Salem um, is is really interesting. Um, are there other examples that you know of, and also from where you sit, what you know, what would what would be the things that might um, that might work to incentivize a, a, a government to um, go ahead and handle, manage the records in a way that it wouldn't cost a lot to, to, to make them public. Yeah, um, so I will preface this by saying I'm not an expert in local government IT at all. And I, I'm sure we have folks on this subcommittee who are better versed in that than I am. Um, you know, I could see for, you know, as with everything, I'm sure there are plenty of small, small cities and taxing districts where cost is truly a barrier to setting something like that up, even though it would save time and money in the long run. And I could see maybe, you know, a state grant program or something like that seems like an avenue that's worth exploring. I don't feel that I know enough to say if that would be effective, but I think that's, you know, that's a common system we see in other cases where there would be sort of a disproportionate cost on small jurisdictions. Um, so I think that would be worth looking into. Um, I think also just, and again, you know, I'm not sure the extent to which this already happens, but sharing of best practices, you know, there are agencies that do make public records disclosure a priority. There are, you know, city recorders who that's a, a very core function of their job. And some of them are from very tiny cities. Um, 
And, you know, to the extent that that this committee or, or legislation, you know, I'm not sure that that would necessarily be a legislative issue, but even informally encourage that sort of um, best practice sharing. I think, though, what I've found as a requester often is that this is also just about culture. Like, simply put, agencies that make transparency a priority and make that clear from the top down are generally responsive and are able to find ways to make this work. Um, and agencies that don't, don't. Um, okay, now I'm thinking about legislating culture. Ha. Um, okay. <laughs> Uh, let's see, Todd, you have your hand up. Go ahead, please. Hey, Rachel, really glad you could be here today. I appreciate your presentation, and I think it dovetails a lot of what I experience as the public records advocate. So just one point and one question. Yeah. The, the point I wanted to make is that my office does, one of the mandates it does or has is that it can assist requesters with uh, what they consider unreasonable fee estimates from public bodies. Of course, there's caveats on that because most public bodies aren't required to participate in my attempts to mediate, but my office does exist as an avenue for that specific reason. I think in part because legislature chose not to make that an appealable matter to the district attorneys and attorney generals, but my office does exist to assist uh, with with that issue to the extent possible. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean to gloss over your work there, but I was more speaking about the formal appeals process and kind of the, the avenues available there. So yeah, no, fair enough. And I've often thought about, do we need to consider adding that to the appeals process as well? Because my help can only go so far in certain circumstances. And then I actually did want to just kind of ask you a question about culture as well, because, you know, uh, obviously, you, you know, you recognize the difference between state and local public bodies. That's often a matter of resources, training staff members, also sort of maybe a cultural perspective on what constituent service looks like as well, but maybe not. Sometimes it's merely resource limitations. And so the law right now does recognize the difference between these types of public bodies through things like timelines, fee estimates, agencies able to determine on their own what constitutes actual cost. There's also this safety valve provision that frees public bodies uh, from even like those types of requirements if they're lacking the ability to change. You know, but I wonder, do you think any further change that gets put into the law should sort of continue to recognize or give space to these differences between different levels of public bodies? Or do we need sort of a one size fits all solution that, that would then compel all public bodies to start baking in more at the outset, sort of dealing with costs themselves so those fees aren't transferred to requesters later. And I'm just really, you know, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm curious yeah, about no, your I, I appreciate the question. That. Yeah, it's a good one, and it's, it's something we've talked about a lot um, in SPJ. I think, I mean, I think there's a couple answers there. I don't think a broad, unfunded mandate, like if, if we were to just pass a law saying you're not allowed to charge fees anymore and you have to figure this out and there's no money to do it, like I don't think that's going to lead to the intended result, much as that might be sort of my fantasy dream world version of things. Um, you know, so I, I don't see that as the solution. I think, um, I think we're not opposed, you know, in, in theory, at least, to some distinctions between smaller and larger entities. Um, you know, I think my preference would be that that there be state practices or aid available to mitigate those so that it doesn't come down to requesters necessarily. Um, you know, like I mentioned, aid with those sorts of programs, things like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I do understand that the city of Portland is a different case than like Lake County government. Um, but I do, I don't want to overlook small agencies. Like I, I think it's important that we try to find ways to, um, to address those concerns, but not to totally exempt them because rural and smaller agencies are so underreported on in Oregon anyway. And that's often so challenging um, for journalists that I really do see a need for reform there as well. I don't know if that answers your question, but no. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Todd, if, Mark. Madam oh. Chair. Yeah, Todd, I just want to be clear going back on history because you did mention the safety valve and, and this was a, a topic. And uh, I, as a member of the Attorney General's Public Records Group, which was established, and forgive me, I'm uh, I'm going to miss this by a year or two, but this was the Michael was um, very instrumental and it with uh, Attorney General um, Ellen Rosenblum. Michael, can you remind me when we uh, did the uh, timeline bill? 
Was it 2017? Uh, it was, yeah, that's correct, Mark. Thank you. You know, um, I, I'm, I have to confess, I'm responsible for the safety valve, all right? I'm the one who actually wrote the safety valve. And I just want everybody to understand why that was done. Um, because it, this was all in the context of timelines, if you'll recall, about issuing or, or producing public records. The challenge for me and my membership is that I've got about one third of our special districts, which amount to about a thousand special districts. So we're talking about 300 special districts in the state of Oregon are run by all volunteers. And the, the way I like to describe it is that special districts aren't Motel 6. The light isn't always on, right? And so there was um, a need to provide, at least in my view, an avenue for um, folks to be able to abide by the law while understanding that there isn't always somebody available to receive a public records request and respond to it in the time that was uh, outlined in the measure. Now, since that time, I, I'm certainly concerned that some other entities that this was not necessarily designed to benefit have used it. And I wanna be very clear about that. Um, and I, I, I do think that that creates a challenge for us I recognize that that is a challenge, but I want to be sure that everybody understands why that was created in the first place. And if we need more discussion on that, I'm more than happy to entertain that discussion. But I just want to be sure that everybody understands why that safety valve was created in the first place. Thank you. And I'm sorry if I distracted from the conversation. Uh, no, super helpful context, Mark. Um, Rachel, I know you need to go in four minutes. Um, I had I had one more question. Does anybody else have a question? I don't see any hands up. And I cannot see your on screen. Sorry, I can only see four people. So if you do want to ask a question, please do it in the, you know, electronic hand raising. Um, Rachel, I want to ask you two things. One, what is the um, what is I mean, how much does SPJ able to provide in fees when people, uh, like you were describing, Kay's? um effort to get records uh from osu uh, what's the what kind of money does spj how, how much do you, do you give in grants each year um we so our grant program is for up to 500 dollars for records fees and generally the way that it works is when someone um asks for help with us we will work with them to kind of um negotiate with the public body and try to get that number down um, and sometimes help them narrow their request because those often come in from journalists who maybe don't have a lot of experience with that process and are also looking for help. Um, we, I would say we generally give out two to three grants a year of a couple hundred dollars. So it is not a major program of ours. Um, we also, you know, don't have the budget for longer you know, for more substantial requests or things like that. We're just for context, we're an all volunteer organization. So we have an eight member board of professional journalists in Oregon. We all have other full time jobs. We have no paid staff. Um, and our revenue comes entirely from donations and proceeds from our annual contest. So, so we are not, <laughs> we're, we're a very, very small band aid on a very big issue. I think you said something like crowdsourcing for funds is not probably basically, yeah of the open government but okay um great well thank you very much uh, anybody else have a quick question for rachel i know you got to go cover the report now okay well thanks and um you mentioned that you might be able to <laughs> compile a list of um uh of something which i can't remember now but it was a list of examples i can't remember the egregious examples of fees or like examples of stories that um you know, when, when public, when fees were waived, you know, made it, made a big difference, but I'm sure we'd love to. Either or both. Yeah. I'd be yeah. happy to do that. Yeah. I can follow up with you. Okay, great. Thank you so very much. Thank you all. Okay. Um, I don't know if Tom Holt is here. Yeah. I see you are here, Tom. Hi. Hi there. I am here. Hi. Thanks a lot for joining us. Um, 
This is Tom Holtz, who's the, on the agenda as the third witness. He's, um, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, lobbyist for, for SPJ. Um, and Tom, go ahead and um, I'm sure we'll have questions for you, but we, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, you know, and for the record, I'm Tom Holt, and I am the lobbyist for the Society of Professional Journalists. And I was asked today to give you a little bit of background of how we approach uh, the public records fee issue legislatively and a little bit of what happened in, in the last session. I'll try not to bore you with too much inside the Capitol baseball, but, um, you know, I so just kind of starting from a public policy point of view, um, we start with the frame that, you know, in Lincoln's phrase, we're a government of the people, by the people, for the people. So the government's records are not the government's per se, like a private organization's records are a private organization's. They are the people's records and the people have a right uh, to get at them uh, through the media. And so, uh, as you probably heard some from Rachel, um, I only got to hear the last couple minutes, but you know, in general, public policy should be um, requiring some degree of efficiency for both public access and for purposes of agency operations, you know, some efficiency, meaning you know, 21st technology and meeting 21st century expectations. So putting it another way, every records request shouldn't require a government employee to go sifting through file boxes of paper or like what my computer tends to look like an electronic dumpster to try to find the responsive records. Um, and, you know, we might even think about in terms of public policy that this idea of being uh, efficient and up to date with the way records are kept as a, as a key performance measure of agencies uh, that they can be held accountable to uh, by the Ways and Means Committees. Now we had a couple of um, bills in the 2021 session in this space. Um, and by now bill numbers have gone out of my mind because we got a whole new set of bill numbers coming up. Uh, but we, we had one that was around fees uh, that had uh, two really key elements. One was um, an automatic pathway to a discount off of fees for media requests because media were presumed to be acting in the public interest. Any requester could get that public interest uh, discount. And then if the uh, requests were narrowly tailored, then the fee could be waived entirely. And this was loosely based on the Office of Legislative Council's policy for the legislature. So, you know, what do we mean by narrowly tailored? It might be something like um, someone makes a request. I want to see all the emails between Senator Smoot and lobbyist Schmendrick between December 10th and December uh, 15th. Uh, that's a that should be a pretty easy request uh, to respond to with an email you know, with an outlook search. Um, and that would be the sort of thing that would uh, get to a, a waiver. But the idea was to, within that kind of structure, there's an incentive for both sides to talk to each other. If it's coming, if the initial request is, oh my gosh, this is going to be complicated to find this, it's going to cost a lot of money, then the agency ought to be picking up the phone and talking to the requester and actually having a conversation about how can we narrow this down to, to what meets your need and makes it less burdensome and costly for the agency. And, and the requester. Um, that bill did not pass. Uh, there were, I think, two big questions that, that came up uh, in the discussion of that bill, um, and they were not necessarily the reasons why the bill died, but these were important questions that revolve around this fee issue, I think, every time it comes up. One is, you know, what's media, and should that be defined? Um, and I think in this age of, you know, web-based media operations like Salem Reporter, uh, you have Substack with, uh, you know, big name journalists are on that and getting, you know, with subscriptions and whatnot, it's pretty hard to pick what, what a media organization looks like as it's not the, all the old newspapers and TV stations of old. 
Um, and for those of you who are history buffs, you might remember that you know in the founding era we had what became the Federalists, and they were anonymous pamphleteers. Uh, they were 200 and some years, 250 years ago, or 240 years ago, they were the equivalent of today's bloggers. Um, and then the the other um, thing that came up, kind of related in that, what is media question is activist groups and think tanks, um, and others with you know. Politicos with what they call news sites, uh, who, you know, those in power, regardless of party, uh, don't particularly like getting requests from them, um, and they are part of the political ecosystem. Uh, I think we view that as being a very uh, tricky area and probably bright line First Amendment stuff. Yeah, the First Amendment, like the rest of the Bill of Rights, doesn't exist to protect popular rights. It, it exists to protect the unpopular rights. So whether someone is a popular requester or an unpopular requester or a, a pain in the neck or not, um, shouldn't play into what uh, request public policy should be. Um, the, I think, you know, kind of where, where uh, the question then is, where where should the the PRAC focus its work uh, in this context? And I think what we would suggest is focusing on that central mission uh, for which PRAC was created around, uh, for lack of a better term, training uh, and encouraging agencies to have better records policies and make it easier to access records in a way that works for all. And that's you know probably crafting some combination of carrots and sticks that you know push their agencies to do the right things. Um, it might begin with, and some agencies already do this at the local level and state level, uh, you know, there's buckets of information that uh, those who who use records a lot uh, are kind of known to be of high interest. Um, and, you know, I think of like, um, if I want to go and find uh, information about my house lot with the county, I can go online and click down through a map and get to it, and I can see what permits were issued on my lot uh, over the years. Um, you know, it's easy, it's free, it's everybody's benefit. I'm not bugging somebody calling them on the phone and making them look something up in a file cabinet. Um, or, you know, if the agency is publishing a chart, for example, uh, that they have a requirement that they publish the numbers behind such a chart. I'll close um, with a story about another bill that I think really kind of, as I thought about it after, when uh, I got your request to come to you today, is the, the bigger problem in a bit of a nutshell. Um, early in the pandemic, uh, the Oregon Health Authority published a bar chart uh, to tell its story the way it wanted it told about the where we were in the pandemic. And unfortunately, that chart was not scaled in a way that anybody could figure out what it meant, uh, that what, what numbers even roughly the chart equated to. So uh, Brad Schmidt of Oregon Live and the Oregonian asked the health authority, can you send me the numbers that were used to build this basically Excel chart? Health authority said, no, that's not public information. Um, and there was a, a lot of coverage about this and, and OHA dug in and said, no, we're not gonna give you those numbers. And I, uh, saw this after the fact after uh, as we got towards session and thought well that's kind of odd because if and and i am not uh, an excel expert playing with pivot tables and things like that but i know enough about it and i've built enough bar charts with it to know that every bar chart has some numbers that were used to build that bar chart so it didn't make any sense and it provoked senate bill 719 uh, which basically said to the health authority uh, you shall uh, release upon request uh, for, you know, high level data reported to the health authorities mandatory deport, uh, report database, provided that information can't uh, 
lead one down a pathway to individually identifiable information or its sources. Uh, so to protect, you know, maintain the, the uh, protection of privacy. Um, had a hearing, uh, had uh, the OHA's resistance and public health resistance in general got kind of a chilly reception in the legislature. Uh, and it passed unanimously out of the Senate Health Committee with language that was agreed to by the health authority. The next step, however, for those of you who know the ways in, uh, the legislative process, know, know what the rest of the story probably is. Uh, it went to the Ways and Means Committee and the health authority, which had agreed to the bill, slapped a $700,000 uh, fee on it or, or cost on it, fees by another name. Um, and claim, oh, we're going to have to hire five or six people. It's indeterminate, but we think we got to hire a bunch of people to handle these requests. Um, I think you can gather from the tone of my voice what I think about that fiscal, uh, but it did, it did not move uh, out of ways and means. And to this day, the numbers behind that bar chart still have not been released. Now, OHA, after all that fracas uh, in the Senate, did improve to some degree uh, what it routinely reports about the epidemic. Uh, but uh, to me, this was one that sort of wrapped up all in one, a high public interest in a, in a high profile issue. The information should have been at OHA's fingertips. They did not uh, provide it. Uh, there was a little bit of a backstory to the bar chart. It did turn out that at least initially, um, they had not compiled it in a way that it was a couple of clicks away to provide the, the numbers. So had it been, you know, saved the way most people would build the bar chart, it should have been a couple of clicks, easy thing, no records request required, you know, sent in response to an email or a phone call from Mr. Schmidt. Uh, but that's not what happened because we don't have public policy that says to the health authority, listen, uh, when you're telling a story to the public, you don't just get to have your spin. You got to let requesters see what's behind that high level story that you've put out. So um, I think that's that's the thing that, you know, just to kind of wrap up that, um, you know, public policy, I think from our perspective, should not encourage or allow the kind of behavior I just described. Whether that's a state agency putting its frame on a really big story of big interest, or it's a school board or school district or a little sewer district that likes to act like a private organization. Um, you know, all this requires some investment uh, by an agency in time and probably money to update systems in many cases uh, to make things accessible. But you know, I think we have to bear in mind that doing that means they are themselves probably going to internally operate a bit better. Um, and so it's to everyone's benefit. And those costs should be largely borne within whatever their general operating budget is, not on the backs of somebody who happens to request a piece of information. Um, you know, is you know, should there, can there be some uh, fees attached? Well, you know, if they're you know, reasonable is in the eye of the beholder, of course. Um, but uh, in general, you know, the the lack of having proper record keeping systems or lack of even approach to uh, public records in some cases, um, that seems to us should not fall on the back of whoever happens to request a piece of information. And that's what I drive policy. Um, I think I heard at the end at the end of your conversation with Rachel that uh, said we would uh, provide you with some examples of you know, good, bad and ugly. And, and there's a lot of good going on. Uh, don't want to leave the impression that nobody's doing a good job with this. A lot of people are uh, thanks in part to this this uh, uh, records council's work. Um, but we'd be happy to provide you with some examples that might help to um, inform your conversations as you think about what the PRAC might do um, in the next year. So happy to engage in any questions or conversation you'd like to have. 
Um, thank you, Tom, very much. Um, let's see, we have a couple of questions, hands up. I'm not sure who was up there first, Mark or um, Steve, but uh, Steve, Steve, I think- was. Steve was, okay, so go ahead, Steve, please. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Um, and thank you, Tom, um, really uh, useful comments. And um, I guess concerning the, um, the treatment of different categories of requesters for purposes of fees, um, I, I believe I'm correct in thinking that uh, Oregon case law anyway treats news media as um, uh, as a public interest requester. I mean, gives deference to news media requests yeah, for purposes of appeals and fee waivers. Yeah. Um, and given that, and also given that the press does have a special mention in the First Amendment, um, and also given that the federal FOIA treats news media as as a separate category. Um, I wonder, did, well, obviously SBJ supported a bill that that had a, a, a specific focus on news media. Uh, I understand there were concerns about that definition, but do you think there is a practical approach that could be taken that could, could address that? I mean, if you were to say, Primarily engaged in the uh, in the production of news or uh, or something that would you know get away from simply a uh, an advocacy organization that happens to run a newsletter or something like that. Um, yeah, um, that's my question. Yeah, I, well, I think you're correct that there's some distinctions made in the in the existing law and case law. I'm not a, I am not a constitutional law expert, but uh, I believe that's so, and 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 certainly in the the bill that we had um, had this shortcut to being determined to be a public interest if you are media. And I think, you know, at least our thinking behind that is that it's it's uh, not a mystery where you're going to end up in that conversation of are you if you're are you media, are you acting in the public interest? Then, yeah, you're going to get there. So why not just put the shortcut in and say, OK, you are now that was also asking on the uh, request E end to use some judgment about, well, is this media that I'm hearing from or is it something else? And if it's something else, they can still get to being in the public interest, but they have to make an argument that they are. Um, you know, as for sort of defining who's in and who's out of those buckets, that's where I think it gets really super tricky. Um, and, I, and I just don't know if there's a a practical line easily uh, drawn in in statute to do that. Uh, we certainly kick the idea around, and and it's sort of a it's it's an almost unsolvable problem. The the ethics commission um, delved into this a number of years ago um, because they they were in a dispute about who gets to sit in on an executive session when they levy penalties or discuss cases. And so they asked their general, their counsel, their assistant attorney general to do a legal opinion. Um, I have it, I'd be happy to provide it or, or Olget can provide it to you. Um, but you know, long story short, they said, um, well, I don't know how you do this. And this was, you know, in early in the internet era when they um, went down that road, you know, several, several years ago. If I if I may ask a follow up, Mark, uh, um, uh, Tom. Uh, so, would, given that, uh, I wonder whether by making a very terse definition or a very broad, vague definition of news media would give both requesters and the public bodies an out. Um, if you know, if there's a dispute over am I in or am I out, you go to court and and hash out what's reasonable. Um, I, I suppose that's possible. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Um, Mark. Well, Tom, thank you for joining us today. Um, when you um, begin your American History 101 class, I'd like to be the first to sign up, uh, quoting <laughs> Abraham Lincoln and and referencing the Federalist Papers. Uh, you had me at hello. So thank you for joining us today. And I do appreciate it. Just two, two quick little um, 
points, and and uh, I'd like to note that the state of Washington does actually have a definition of the news media. It's been um, uh, uh, litigated before, and and the courts have uh, opined on on the media. And so, I would point out to folks that that me, and I don't know if it's for, I, it may be for the purposes of public records. I Don't quote me on that, but I do know that the state of Washington does have a definition of uh, the media. So um, it's not necessarily um, something that doesn't exist in statute. Mm -hmm. um, so having said that, the other thing that I just wanted to mention that, that Tom made a very um, astute comment about, and I think we all recognize it, is that, you know, um, the commitment of a local government to making records available, to some extent, is dependent on the resources that they have, right? I, I think that we can all agree to some extent that um, local governments exist to provide a service to their citizens. And I, I don't think we're going to have much hopefully argument with that. Having said that, many local governments do to a variety of different reasons, not to mention property taxes, and boy, we could spend hours talking about that if you wanted. Um, local governments really are limited on the resources that they have and really do try, um, I think, to deliver those services in the most effective and efficient cost um, uh, efficient manner possible. Um, having said that, when you have very small governments with very limited um, resources to invest, for example, into um, various potential programs, particularly for public records, let's say, where a small local government gets maybe one, two requests a year at best, What's the, uh, th there's not much of a uh, compelling reason to, to uh, invest a lot of treasure into updating a system. So I just want everybody to, to keep that in mind, right? That the ability to invest in this is limited to the amount of resources that a local government has. That's not true in all cases. We all know that there's some very large local governments that have very large sums of, of treasure, shall we say, but there are also some 300 of my members I've already said are run by volunteers. Well, I have another 300 members, some volunteers who have an annual budget of less than $100,000 a year, okay? So I just, want, I just want to have a reality check that local government is not swimming in resources to be able to invest in whatever they feel they should or whatever we feel they should. Um, and um, I'm, I'm not trying to challenge you in any way, shape or form, Tom. I think that your, your points were very valid. I just want to provide a little context. Thank you very much for being here, Tom, and I'll look forward to some other conversations. No, I, I appreciate that, Mark. Um, the I mean, yeah, clearly there's, you know, particularly in Oregon where we have this special district system where you have some really tiny governmental entities, um, one size does not necessarily fit all. Um, you know, I, although I would just want to underscore one thing that, you know, to the extent governments of any size get better at organizing their records, it makes their lives easier day to day, whether they're getting a records request or not. Uh, so it's kind of, kind of in all of our interests. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, Michael, I think you had your hand up next. Is that is that right? Or uh, I'm not sure whether it was Todd or Michael, but Michael, why don't you go ahead? Okay, uh, well, I'm maybe just going to share some context. I don't disagree with what you just were saying, Mark, but I think, you know, I will never forget when uh, in 2011, we were talking at the legislature about fee reform and a very large public body showed up and claimed they had no money to spend on public records requests. 
like testified to that effect in a legislative committee that they just didn't have a budget for it. Well, I, w- I walked out of that hearing and just kind of looked at up their budget and they had like a $2 million budget for public information officers, right? So I think one of the, one of the things that I've sort of felt since that day, and this is maybe my own sort of trauma and scar, as, as relatively insignificant as it may be, is that, you know, maybe we, sh- we need to tie some of the public body's responsibility to do this work to the money they're spending on, you know, getting the messages that they want out to the public. Like, why, why, why did why did this public body have the gall to stand up in front of the legislature and say, well, we have, you know, we have $2 million to spend getting out the information that we want to get out. And we have no money at all to spend to, to disclose the records that members of the public, members of the press are asking for. So that that's, and that's, you know, I'm not, we're probably not at the point of discussing policy, but I think there may be some ways to address the real challenges you're talking about, Mark, while while also improving things, especially when we're dealing with agencies that clearly have the money if they if they only had the will. Thank you, Michael. Um, Todd, do you want to go ahead, please? Sure. Thanks, Emily. Hey, Tom. I'm really glad you're here with us today. Thank you for that presentation. Thanks. And uh, since we have you, uh, I'm inclined to just start sharing war stories, but I would much rather get your opinion about something I've been seeing and a little bit more so recently, which is this. So um, more, I'm seeing when public bodies, so I'm seeing that sometimes when public bodies deny fee waivers or reductions, they either sort of state what the countervailing interests are in terms of like other public records requests are dealing with or uh, just other issues the public bodies addressing addressing lack of staff lack of resources etc and i'm seeing them either giving those other factors sort of an equal weight to this balancing act with the public interest of releasing the records but i'm also seeing a lot of public bodies merely saying to a requester well under the totality of the circumstances we we're turning down your request, not really elaborating, but I'm assuming they're, they're doing this balancing act. So in any reform that we consider recommending to the legislature, what is your opinion about one, maybe defining what sort of countervailing interests a public body can take into account when determining, even if there is a public interest, they still can't waive or reduce fees. And uh, should those other factors be given equal weight to determining, like if they determine there is a public interest, should they be seen as sort of equal? Uh, 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 countervailing measures or concerns? Uh, that, that's a great question. Um, I mean, my, my sort of top of mind is I think of things like, you know, might an agency say, well, you know, gee, we're happy to provide this, but this is going to take somebody a week to dig up full time, you know, and so therefore, you know, we got to have some fees. Um, you know, the, uh, I don't have a good answer for you on on kind of the, you know, is it's hard to judge uh, when you get some of those just very high level of, well, we have these other competing interests and therefore, you know, the fee is going to be, you know, $3,237. Um, you don't know what's gone into that calculation. Um, so I think certainly at least having to detail what those things are uh, so people know what it is that they're trying to overcome. Uh, maybe some of those things lead to, you know, narrowing a request so that it isn't quite so burdensome. Um, so I guess bottom line, it's it's worth talking about, but I don't have a good answer for you today. If I may, I just want to share an experience I'm going on with right now with a different state where I've requested a number of records um, that the state presents annually in a statistical report. When I asked for the underlying records, they said uh, they are all held in boxes and they're PD, they're, uh, they're actually pieces of paper. We will have to go through them one by one. And I wrote back and I said, how can you possibly do a statistical report if you don't have this moved off of your pieces of paper into a spreadsheet? I'm still awaiting a response. So um, it's a <laughs> it's it's a thing, um, Tom. I don't see any other hands up right now. I wanted to ask you. Um, you, you know, you talked about waivers uh, for different different things, and um, I just wonder if 
what you think about you know, systems, one, a system that um, approaches things by providing waivers and one, a system that you, you don't have to get a waiver that there's a, that there's a structure, uh, and I'm not totally sure what this might be, but there's a structure that um, provides for public records to, to, you don't, for, you don't have to, you don't have to ask for something special um, to be able to access them without inordinate costs. Um, I don't know if that's something that's con considered or you've seen other places, but what about that kind of system where you're not asking for a fee waiver? Yeah, I may put it another way, you don't have to prove your worthiness to get at the records. Uh, well, yeah. there's worthiness of public interest. I mean, yes, you could say it lots of different ways, but um, ultimately yeah. you have to say something, yes. Um, well, I mean, I think philosophically, you know, the the if there's a bias, it, it should be toward providing what is public information to the public and representatives of the public. You know, and everything else streams from there. There can be good reasons for something not being public information, say, you know, in the case of, you know, some stuff the health authority handles, there's personally identifiable health information. We have lots of law around that. That's not releasable. Um, certain types of personnel records are not releasable under state law. Um, so there's, you know, there are some areas, but those those should be the exception rather than the rule. Isn't it the policy? Isn't the policy pretty much stated at the beginning of the statute? It's, you know, the preference is for disclosure. Yeah. Right, I think but, what we're, or I, we heard from Rachel is, um, as well as other folks, that, that um, the, 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 the fees, in fact, get, like, they, they play a role in that. They, they actually counter. Oh, yeah. No, 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 no. I, 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 I get, I get it. The fees are a disincentive for people to pursue records because of the cost limitations. I get it. Yeah. I know you do. Um, let's see. Anybody else have their hands up? Uh, Steve, did you just put your hand down? Okay. Uh, right. I'm going up and down. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to respond to a couple of things that uh, that others have mentioned. Um, Michael, uh, ditto what you said. Um, I, I do think if, if it, I think and I think there's a public body that is that is spending money. A lot of money on getting its message out that it should be able to, to carry the, the weight of disclosure um but mark um i i think you're totally right when you're talking about like i don't think we could see a system that would mandate that uh that all governments upgrade their their records management systems to meet a certain standard um what I do think we could do is if there are agencies that are upgrading their records management systems, that they add in certain marginal specifications, you know, additional specifications that would get them to that standard. Um, yeah. So, so, so something along the line of a, a, a system wide uh, IT upgrades whereby certain um, principles have to be achieved. And it's sort of getting to, you know, transparency by design, Steve, if if I'm still trying to understand this. And I think it makes infinite amount of sense, right? It, it, it just, it makes sense to me. Um, I'm, I'm, believe it or not, I'm with you guys. I'm, I'm, I'm following you guys. I'm drinking a bit from the Kool-Aid with a very small coffee straw at the moment. Um, and I'll just leave it at that, okay? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great analogy. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, you know, I'd like to ask, um, just for my own education, and I apologize for people who know this really well, but how often do agencies upgrade? I'm just um, wondering, like, you know, if, if that was something that was built in, how many years or decades would, would, would we be looking at? Well, I, I, at, at, right at the outset, I can tell you, I still have districts that have metal files, okay? I promise you. They're in a dark basement under, you know, the the trailer 
that serves as the office, right? So they they exist, um, but that, it's a really good question. I don't know what the uh, timing is. I suspect it's every five to 10 years, depending on resources, right? I've heard legends of uh, state agency, and I don't actually believe this is true. I think it's just like an urban legend of a state agency still using a punch card computer system. But <laughs> I, I think the reality is, the, what is true is that I don't, I don't think the money is there to keep record systems up to date very often. Yep. I think it is pretty infrequent. I know the Secretary but of State and maybe Todd, you know more about this, has kind of been trying to to get modernized record systems, at least under the under the prior state archivist. Um, but we can also ask Stephanie, I suppose, next time we see her, which I'm sure will be soon. It looks like Miles has something for us. I, I get you beat. We use a mainframe for our bill drafting software. <laughs> But that sounds old. Um, 80s, probably. Uh, ouch, ouch. Although, yeah, I hope it's wearing some cool clothes, but wow. Uh, it's not. It's, <laughs> it, it, it's still, I mean, it's like command keys, um, green, and I mean, like the, the just text-based, no windows. Our drafting software is ancient. Um, yeah, Steve. Sorry, I have my hand up again. Um, I, in preparation for um, Catherine Helms uh, visit last week, um, I actually did a little research on the state contracting website and for over the past two years for IT contract and found at least probably about a dozen um, contracts for database upgrades, like, you know, significant information management systems that were being replaced. So it, it happens, you know, and it, it would take a long time to to bring everything up to snuff, but um, it's a, it happens. Well, if, if I may, I mean, there's not everything is like, you know, an Iron Mountain um, record system per se, you know, uh, if you're really small, you can subscribe to Microsoft uh, 365 and you have a version of SharePoint available to you. And, and so, you know, folks could be thinking about that sort of thing incrementally as a as a go forward versus a, oh, my God, I got to update this thing that, you know, got to kind of know how programming to even use it uh, today. It might be something to consider. Okay, thank you. Uh, Todd, I think you briefly had your hand up and possibly took it down, but did you have a question? Well, I was going to follow up on what Steve said after Catherine's presentation. I reached out to her and we're going to have further discussions about how, at least at the state level, uh, enforcement of that transparency clause and all contracts could start being enacted maybe during the contract review process. So she and I are going to be continuing that conversation offline to see what we could figure out. Oh, that's great. Great. It's a really good presentation. Love to have that. Um, OK, um, Ellen, I thank you for still being here. I thought I maybe saw your hand up. Um, did you have something that you wanted to join back into the conversation? No, I, if, I, if I touched it, it was <laughs> incorrect, but yeah. Um, yeah, really great discussion. Yeah, okay, great, thank you. Okay, well, um, I think we have like, just a few minutes of um, committee business on like how to go forward. So, um, you know, Tom, thank you so very much for um, coming and talking to us today and uh, we'll be in touch um, for to follow up on some of the things you mentioned. Um, but does anybody have a last, uh, a final question for Tom? Or I... <laughs> Actually. Right. Well, Great. thank you very much for having me today. I appreciate it. Appreciate the dialogue and and uh, again, uh, uh, available to work with you in any capacity needed on on behalf of SPJ uh, as you go forward on these issues. Great. Thank you very much, Tom and Ellen. Thank you again as well. Um, you're welcome to stick around to the end of the meeting, but just wanted to express our appreciation of your coming to testify and I'm sure we'll turn to you for some more follow-up information as well. So much appreciated. Um, to the, just before we do this final, like uh, we need to talk about LPRO for a second and then the next series of meetings. So, but is there anything, anybody who's on the subcommittee wants to say um, just about what you heard today or um, anything right now? I know we'll be 
you know, digesting all this and putting it in together with other things we're learning. But is there anybody who'd like to make a comment about what stands out to them from today's testimony? Well, I hope you all kept good notes. Okay, um, let's see, where's my agenda? Right, okay, so we want, we have this um, opportunity, again, thanks to Senator Thatcher to request LPRO um, do some research for us. And I think most of you were at the meet, the PRAC meeting, oh God, was it just last week? where um, we heard from the LPRO staffers um, about how they would like you know, to receive a request. Um, I just wondered if um, we could finalize that today, if there's, if there's, um, if there's, if there's, uh, if there's any, any, like, should, should we just go with like the, you know, I mean, I can work with LPRO to, to follow up on their, um, on their outline of how they'd like to get information and craft something or, um, somebody um, want to do that or weigh in on this? Um, is there anything specific that people really want to know from LPRO? Todd? Yeah, since there's such a limited resource, and I think we, all of us together through our experience with this testimony, sort of have an understanding of what's happening here in Oregon. And I think what we really need to hear from the outside, sort of consolidated in one place, are what are the other systems of uh, fees or costs that are imposed for public records requests, because as I think Melissa from LPRO mentioned, you know, they could sort of break down the different states into buckets or systems and who knows what will emerge as like the most common or the most reasonable. But I think we need sort of that basis of comparison rather than like sort of like a 50 state survey, just like what are the handful or so of most prominent systems out there? And then also uh, detail in the federal system, although we could maybe just get that testimony on our own. But certainly, I think I would like to hear what are the most common systems in use in other states. Okay. And then there was anybody else want to comment? There was also some discussion about whether they could um, look at those in uh, uh, what it would take to change Oregon law um, to you know enact any to, to sort of follow suit up on in any of those buckets, if you will. I, I, yeah, I, I, I don't. Oh, go ahead, Todd. I'm sorry. sorry. No, I was going to say that would be a nice extra filter to kind of run their results through. But, uh, Todd, on, but I, I fear that that might create a little extra work for, for LPRO at, at this point. I mean, if they were to come up, let's say, with six different models, they would then have to go through six different exercises to see how they would fit that into the statute. I don't know if that's the best use of their time at this point. No, um, Mark, you're right. But, I'm but sorry, I'm, I forgot. No, you're right. The suggestion was they could tell us what systems are out there. We could then sort of consider that and then come back to them and ask them uh, which systems, like of which systems we were most interested in, other than that of a barking dog. <laughs> uh, you know, how did that compare to Oregon law? Yes. So yeah, phase one would just be the different systems of fees out there. You're right. Thank you. Okay, great. And Steve, you just put in the chat. I think LPRO has my request, but I'll repeat it here. Um, uh, what do you mean? Do you think LPRO has your request? I think they were uh, in attendance at the meeting where I shared this, which was the last legislative sub meeting. Got it. And I think uh, I think they mentioned it actually when when they talked to us last week at the PRAC. Um, but if it's helpful, you have it here now. So. Uh, right, but you didn't mean that they agreed to go forward on that, just that they'd seen what your proposal was, right? Or yeah, it sounded like they were were interested in going down this route, but I, I don't know. Uh, since we're talking about finalizing it, well, just put it Melissa yeah. <laughs> Melissa Leone is here with us. Oh, from oh. Elbridge. thanks, Mark, for noticing Melissa. So, um, Melissa, I, I, um. You've probably seen, as Steve suspects, this this breakdown of sort of an approach to it. Um, is this something? And you can see it in the chat now. If you if you don't remember it from last meeting, but is this some an approach that you think would fit into the um, resources of Elpro? So I think I was describing it as I saw a set of questions that Steve had posed that could help guide us in the information we'd collect from the states. So. If those are the pieces of information that you all want to know, I mean, I, the first conversation is, is 
if what you want is just sort of general, then we can look at those other states and look at, you know, look for the, you know, as they start to align with each other. But if there are some specific pieces of information you want to know and some certain elements of public records costs that you want to know, if you can identify for that up front, then we don't, you know, we don't play the bring me a rock game. And uh, we know what color, size, shape, form that you would like to know information from other states. Yeah. Okay. And I, I did um, in previous meetings, chats, I did copy Steve's list of questions. So I do have them. Okay, great. Uh, Mark, sorry, did you want to go ahead? Uh, you're muted. Uh, well, that's the first time today. So that's a record for me. I made it till almost three o'clock. Um, I guess, well, my question is, Senator Thatcher was going to submit a letter uh, to LPRO making this request. My recollection is that during our last meeting, we were going to have a couple people compose a couple paragraphs uh, that could, um, well, that I thought we might be reviewing perhaps this meeting um, that then could be forwarded on to uh, Senator Thatcher, who could incorporate it into a formal request to LPRO. I think we're still at that stage of um, trying to get um, those paragraphs, if you will, uh, applied to paper so that the subcommittee can sort of all give it its blessing and then forward on to Senator Thatcher. Is my memory serving me correctly or incorrectly? Yeah, it's probably me who volunteered to do that. And I've had the last two weeks of like complete deadline uh, I get it, and I'm not. I'm. I'm not pointing fingers. I'm good at pointing fingers in other directions, and I'm not doing it at you, Emily. I, I. I just thought that that was the process that we had agreed upon. If it hasn't gotten done, I'm sure there are legitimate reasons, and I think we all understand that. We're all pros here, with the exception of me. So I would just like to, you know, make sure that um, if we're moving forward, that we're following the process by which we had agreed to previously. Yeah, um, let's, if you don't mind, oh, we only have five more minutes. Um, can people look at this, what Steve's put in the chat and just like, is this, maybe we can just wordsmith this a tiny bit right now, um, but it sounds to me like there's uh, two things that we'd like to do and that I believe would work um, for LPRO just based on what Melissa just said. But one is to try to sort of categorize what are the common Features. What are the what are the common practices? Um, and then to answer these specific questions that Steve has has written, can folks just take a minute to look at this and, and see if there's any comments? And um, you know, I can use this to draft something in the next couple of weeks for our next meeting, or we can do it on email. Well, I don't see anything in here, and sorry, I'm just glancing through it, Steve. But I don't see anything in here for media. Uh, discounts or or fee waivers. Uh, I mean, I think that that is a legitimate straight straight up question that, yeah, that ought to be posed. Well, one that gets at that is specific fee waivers or reductions for classes of requesters, such as commercial commercial. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, very good. Thank you. Oh, good. Okay. I, I guess, um, respond, sorry, responding just for my part, re responding to what Melissa said, um, I think I, I would be fine with basically, I, I, I think I get what you're proposing is basically using this as a roadmap that could help you discern what the models are. And I, I would be fine with that approach too. Uh, um, if you want like a specific list of questions like, you know, must have, um, I guess I would ask whether this list is reasonable or, or whether we should truncate it. Uh, I think that's a question to Melissa, is that right? Yeah. Melissa, are you still here? Can you weigh in on that? I don't know the answer to that, honestly. Um, 
having not looked at other states and what's available. And I think as Ellen's pointed out, uh, and I think as some of you have pointed out in previous meeting notes, there are sources that have started to collect some of this information or that have pieces of this information. I, I don't know the answer to that, honestly. Okay. Um, if we picked three or four from this list, I just wonder if anybody on the committee might have priorities that they would especially want to know specifically about. Maybe they're all important. Um, and I realize we are one minute left. Um, Todd, um, did you want to you your hand up, I think? I do, thanks. Well, two things. One, I really like Steve's list here, although I will, would be a little worried about sort of constraining our search to specifically these questions rather than guiding LPRO, if LPRO is comfortable with that, because we don't know, at least I don't know what most other state systems look like. And so these are great ways to think about the research while it's being done, but I don't know what LPRO is going to encounter. and I. If they're comfortable mm -hmm. with sort of this broader question that we define for them and they accept and then have these as a guide, I'd like to leave it a little more in their hands to sort of determine their own path of research, if that works for them. But the other thing I was going to say was we have Tyler here as a guest, even though he hasn't been confirmed yet. And since he is representative of the counties, if you're inclined to hear from him, Emily, and he has anything to add, I would love to hear his opinion on the course of research too, because whatever we do will certainly affect the counties too. Oh, uh, yeah, of course. Go ahead. Well, thank you for that, Todd. Um, let me pull up this, this list as well. I've just been taking copious notes of this meeting. Um, was the question of this list, of the bulleted list in front of us, which which ones might rise to the top of priorities from a county perspective? Right, like if it's used, um, if it's used, if, if we didn't ask LPRO to answer every single one of them for each state, are there a few that you would really want to know the answers to? That's a uh, it's one that I would want to check in with a few people and get some feedback on. Um, give me a moment to look at this and think about it for a second. And if we get to a public comment period at the end of this or in a couple minutes, I might have a better answer. You know, I think it's probably gonna have to be done during do be over email anyway to get like some actual language to put together. So don't worry. Um, <laughs> you can do it. We'll do it and we'll do it in email. Um, can I ask a question? Ms. Chair, while we have, uh, thank you. I'm wondering whether, uh, given that, you know, LPRO is not sure whether this is a reasonable or unreasonable list of questions, can we just like be in contact with them? I mean, can they come back to us and be like, you know what, this is not, this is not working? I mean, it feels, it's a little weird to me to think about which of these I would cut when I'm not even sure that we need to cut any. So I'm just wondering if that makes sense to have like sort of a collaborative, more of a like occasional check-ins even with with you guys as you're sort of doing your work. Yeah, Melissa, you pop back on. Yeah, you want to I uh, assume that question was for us. Um, I I think a a back and forth conversation and us um, coming to your meetings with some updates um, we could do. As long as we are still sort of in the in the environment where this is the request for Senator Thatcher, right? That mm -hmm. Elpro provides information to legislators, so we may communicate more directly with her office as the requester first. If we have questions, or as we begin to collect information and we begin yeah. to see what's more readily available and not readily available, and then she can share that with all of you and we can come to meetings and have a conversation. And specifically, just like if this looks like it's not really feasible as you get into it, not necessarily that you need to like keep us surprised otherwise, but that's yeah. Yeah, I think we do have to get together some, uh, you know, paragraphs as uh, Mark was saying to um, ask the Senate Center if, if, if she'd be willing to um, make that request to Bell Pro so that um, that'll be the the next step. And um, thanks, Melissa, for being flexible and also clarifying. Yeah, what is what is the is the best method to approach staying in touch? Um, okay, so this time I will do this before um, 
our next meeting. Um, and I'm highly cognizant it's after three o'clock, but um, our next meeting is January 7th. And we were hoping to, you know, be able to hear from people um, at each of the next of our meetings through April um, to help us get ideas together for legislation. Um, is there anyone who has been thinking of who they would like to ask to testify? Um, is that something that anyone could do by January 7th? Um, are folks are folks able, willing, and 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 uh, interested in putting together panels themselves, um, filling out that calendar that I shared with you? Or, um, Go ahead, Mark. Oh, I was hoping I saw your hand go up before mine. I only unmuted Steve. I didn't raise a hand, so you go right on ahead. Um, I have been working on uh, working my way to some leading FOIA experts uh, who could form a panel, um, but I don't think there's any way I could possibly do it by January seventh. Um, even the fourteenth, I think, would be pushing it. I mean, not the the fourteenth. I guess it would be the What's the next one? 28. 28. Yeah. I mean, that is that is conceivable. Um. Emily, I, I was I was going to simply uh, suggest that, you know, we have a number of meetings set up and I, I'm sure it was your intent. And I I suspect we had discussed this at our previous meeting. But I do think that we're going to need at least one and probably more like two to three for the, the general public to be able to um, address the council as well. I think that, um, you know, in our efforts to be as transparent as possible as the PRAC and, you know, carrying on through to the subcommittees, I do think that um, we're going to, I, I think it would be in our interest uh, to be as thorough as possible and have at least one. Um, and again, maybe as depending on the interest of the public, of uh, uh, addressing the, the subcommittee as well. Yeah, for sure. We can make January 7th uh, one of those. Um, and and I would encourage everybody to, uh, I mean, I'll, I, I, we can, I'm happy to do that. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I can put an agenda together pretty easily for that now. So we could get the word out. I would encourage everybody to spread that uh, among their networks. So, um, but but I do I do really want to emphasize that the only way we're going to get people to 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 bring us information and to testify over the course of the next week is, is if people who are on the committee can um, yeah. you know if nothing else contribute names and and uh, phone numbers do the footwork to get people to uh, agree to do it I mean I can certainly help with logistical stuff um, as necessary but that's the only way we're going to get the information that we need so I just really want to encourage you to start thinking about who you um, th that list I sent around is a working document that has some ideas that people have suggested of who they want to hear from and it's incomplete it's it's going to keep growing and people will bring up, up others so um so uh yeah that's we, we'll just start thinking about um what you know what's going to work what's going to work for you uh Todd and then Steve so I'm I'm more than happy to volunteer to take a panel. I was going to uh, suggest FOIA, but uh, I'm you know that's if Steve wants it, he can have it. Although I, Steve, I recommend you consider reaching out to the FOIA Ombudsman at OGIS, because Office of Government Information Services. Because in addition to talking about how FOIA has a tiered system, they could talk about what the problems are with that system. In my opinion, so I would instead I'd be happy to take maybe state and local uh, government records custodians so we could get their perspective. But I have a bunch of trainings coming up and I'm very close to getting the job posting posted for the deputies. I think I'm going to be busy with recruitment and I'm still working on uh, housing for the office. Uh, so I honestly don't think I could spearhead a panel till uh, maybe the March 11th or at the earliest the February 18th one, but I'd be happy to start trying to get people available for one of those. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Steve, you have your hand up. Uh, yeah, I just wondered what resources we might have beyond reaching out to our networks, like to actually go a little more grassroots with, um, you know, bringing in members of the public and also whether we need more time to do that. Um, I don't know if anybody has any thoughts about public engagement or experience more so than I. My recollection is that uh, 
Senator Thatcher thought that the legislative offices might have good like ability to do that kind of sort of general public outreach. Um, of course, there are only ex officio members of of our committee as a whole, but that it I do imagine that they have constituency lists and contacts that could be useful. Um, you know, I think there are some advocacy organizations that I could certainly reach out to. Um, Osberg and some of the environmental and immigration based nonprofit and enter enterprises that we work with in our office, but just sort of like general public. I, I don't really know that any of us are going to be as well positioned as the legislative offices. OK, well, um, I'm going to suggest this for the next meeting. We'll approve the or, you know, edit and approve whatever the LPRO paragraphs that I'll put together and then um, Let's uh, if let's open it up and make this one meeting that's available to the public. We'll do as much outreach as we can in the next couple of weeks, three weeks, I guess. I, um, and um, if if you know if people don't come to testify, we certainly can um, talk about what we heard already that you know started us thinking about possible I, 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 way too early to try to draft something, but just kind of talk about what what questions and what ideas um, the testimony we had so far percolated among us. I do want, to, is that okay with everybody? Does that sound like a reasonable step to take for the next meeting? I'm not really hearing objections. I'm seeing one head nod. So go ahead with that plan. Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, and then I do, uh, you know, I know we're over time and uh, I, I just wanna check with if there's anybody in the public, um, we're not going to we're not going to vote on anything today, so there's nothing to weigh in on before we actually take a decision. But is there anybody from the public who who would like to say something today? Um, could you raise your hand now or unmute and say something now? Uh, Emily. Yes. Hi. Uh, Chair Harris, actually, this is Les Ruark, instant person from out in Hinterlands, and I was just curious about. Um, AOC's representation today. I joined late here, but it sounded like there was reference to maybe Tyler Stone that's uh, on board today uh, on behalf of AOC, given that Rob is, has left that position. Is that accurate? Not Tyler. Uh, Tyler is uh, awaiting confirmation to fill that seat. But it's not Tyler Stone. His name is Tyler Jansen. Oh, okay. Well, that's what, I, yeah. And, um, how how long I'm a little bit I guess playing some catch up here, but how long how long ago was that nomination submitted? The last round? Todd, you may know better than I, but the they were it was sometime in the past several months any new nominations were um were submitted. Uh we had one new uh member join um already and was confirmed in November. Um Shasta Tyler is Tyler is up in February, as am I, and there may be another individual or two. I don't know, Todd, but I know Tyler, and I I, I haven't gotten confirmation that – no, I have gotten confirmation all my stuff is in. So I, I, I believe that at least Tyler and I are up on in February, and I'm actively lobbying on against my nomination. Kidding. I'm also up in February, but I don't know when the nomination was um, was made, but the hearing will be in February. Okay, good. I appreciate the update. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for, for attending. Anybody else um, in the public would like to make a comment? Can you unmute and say something or raise your hand now? Okay, we're going to close it up. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate it. And thank you for sticking around for the next for the extra 12 minutes. Wow. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Right, we'll see you on January 7th. All right. Happy New Year, everybody.